Thank you so much. I have to say it's a great delight to be here. I just think that this is such an important conference. And uh, you just have to see how many people are here. And of course, it's a two-day conference. So I know you're going to cover a huge amount of ground. But to see people for real is a real treat because so often we've been on Zooms and uh, having to watch screens and things like that. But to be with you all is, is really lovely. So I feel today we're surrounded by um, a whole lot of technical wizards. And I know that you know much better than I do that technology can do wonderful things. And of course, we saw a lot in the pandemic um, and that has proved really be never before what can be achieved when we're under huge pressure. We've seen the development of antiviral um, diagnostic tests used at home. Uh, we can upload those on our iPhones. These are enormous gains um, and we must be very careful that they're not lo lost. And encouragingly, I can see that we're becoming much more techno-friendly because we've got 25 million now of us who have the NHS app on our phones. But of course, this is just the start. As Sajid Javid said in his reform speech, uh, and just last week, I think it was, we must keep up the momentum. Digital health, care plans, virtual wards, ordering blood tests as easily as we can order food delivery. All of these things are exciting and they are within our reach. Now, I'm a fan of digital transformation. When we were last allowed uh, before the lockdown, I visited Derby, having heard from Glenn, I think it was, and others, about the sites that were pioneering Scan for Safety. And what a revelation that was for me. And now I know it's been spawned across England, and there are many such sites. And what a tremendous movement that is. And it brought home to me the power of data and I know what, that we're only now seeing its immense potential. Now, we have a long way to go, and we need to get the basics right, and that is quite difficult. My thinking about data and digital technology has been shaped by my recent involvement in two major inquiries, inquiries into the NHS. In 2014, I was asked by Simon Stevens, now Lord Stevens, to chair an inquiry into maternity services for England. And Simon, Simon gave us nine months to deliver it. I thought that very appropriate for maternity <laughs> services. And I have to say, we did achieve his target. We produced our report entitled Better Births in 2015, and we were delighted that we had 28 recommendations, all of which were accepted. Now, NHS England then set up the Maternity Transformation Board, and I serve on that. And the whole purpose of that board was to implement these recommendations. Now, I've noticed with some of my reports and other people's reports that once they're delivered, nothing happens. So this was a new way of doing things. This was an implementation board to ensure that our recommendations uh, were um, implemented. In our report, we recommended that every mother should have her own digital maternity record which she would create with her midwife. Its purpose 
was to set out the plans for managing her pregnancy, the birth of the baby, and the uh, postnatal period. And it was for her to exercise her choices and made them known to the people who were looking after her. The record would then be accessible and to all those who were contributing to her care, but only with her permission. A simple concept and actually a really important one because it would improve outcomes, enhance safety for both the mother and the baby, and it would put the woman in and her family, we always have to forget the family, in greater control of her health and her maternity journey. When, before the lockdown, when I was out on platforms in a much greater extent than I am now, it was very interesting that women in the audience would ask the question, NHS, where are you now? My life is on my iPhone, and I'm afraid to say you are in the dark ages. And it really brought home to me how this cohort of women, who obviously are very knowledgeable about technology, it's part of their lives, was feeling excluded because we, the NHS, were not actually meeting their demands. So although it's right to say that some progress has been made, um, and certainly with improving access to NHS records, we're still some way from achieving what these women were asking for. And indeed the ambition that's in the long-term plan. And in the long-term plan, it says that every citizen should have their own personal health record. And if we really want to achieve the Secretary of State's vision for personalised care, then we need everyone to have their own digital personal health and care record. Now, in the last two years, we've shown that we can act with speed when we want to and when we need to. But we need to galvanise the NHS to move more quickly and to capitalise on the enormous potential that digital offers. But the experience that really changed my views on digital and data, and actually I have to say many as other aspects of healthcare, came from the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review, uh, which I chaired. We had a fabulous team, uh, what do they say, uh, small but perfectly formed. We had three decision makers at the top, and then we only had half a dozen, about six support staff. And we worked for two and a half years on introducing our report. Uh, we initially were commissioned by Jeremy Hint, uh, who was then Secretary of State for Health, uh, on the instructions of Theresa May, the Prime Minister. And we were asked to look at three areas, investigate uh, two medicines and one medical in, uh, device. And all three have caused avoidable harm. And we have witnessed from those who have so suffered the intensity of their suffering and it's been on enormous scale. And actually, these three areas were quite different. Sodium valparate, a medicine that treats epilepsy, but when taken by uh, women who are pregnant, it causes a one in two risk of harm to the unborn baby. Primados, a hormone pregnancy test taken by women in the 1960s and 70s, and also linked to uh, the damage to their children. And surgical mesh, which was used to, stress, uh, used to uh, treat uh, stress urinary uh, incontinence. 
and of course also pelvic organ prolapse in women. And that has caused life-changing, often devastating complications for so many women. All three are different, but they are linked by some common factors. They all affected women. The concerns that women voiced about these medicines and devices was totally ignored and denied. And in each case, there was, and there still is, an absence of data. In fact, an absence of even the most basic records. Prebodos was finally removed from the market in the late 70s. But the damaged children, now adults, are living proof of a system that failed to act on concerns that had been forced years earlier. And I find it truly shocking that Valparate is still being prescribed to women, sometimes without them being made aware of the risks. Thousands of children have been harmed because the mothers of those children were never warned. And that continues today. And the use of pelvic mesh is paused. Because very early on in our review, we were just so shocked by the stories that we heard from women about the damage it was causing them. That we asked the Department of Health and NHS England to stop the use. And they did. And the pause remains in place today. These treatments have caused avoidable harm to many thousands of women and children. And tragically, it's not something that belongs to the past. They continue to live with the consequences even today. And this harm didn't take place in one isolated moment. It has spanned over years and even over decades. So why was it not detected and stopped? Many people could have been spared much misery if it had. A very significant part of the answer lies in the absence of data. We found that data was not collected. And when it was, there was no attempt to link the data to identify patterns of concern. Such paper records as there were, were incomplete. They were dispersed, they were archived, or they were destroyed. The absence of data meant that the healthcare system couldn't tell us how many women had taken sodium valparate and then gone on to have damaged children. We don't know where these children are today. Whether they've been diagnosed with fetal valproate spectrum disorder or whether they are getting the care that they need. We still don't know the true numbers affected, even today. We don't know how many women took primados, how many miscarriages occurred, how many children were born with physical malformations, or how many died in childhood, or indeed, how many are alive today as adults in need of care and support. It couldn't tell us how many women had pelvic mesh implants, or which implants were used, or where and when, and we still don't know. We don't know how many are experiencing complications on, um, or what the long-term effects are of these uh, mesh implants into the pelvis. We were astonished and we were deeply worried. The system was flying blind. How could there be such serious shortcomings when we all recognise the power and the importance of collecting good data. The problems are really quite fundamental. Firstly, data collection in healthcare, uh, as I have to say in many aspects of healthcare, 
is far too fragmented and no one is responsible for joining it all up. So different people in different parts of the healthcare system collect data on procedures, medications, devices, incidents, adverse outcomes, um, and that information is kept in different places. Clinicians, managers, regulators, and policy makers see different combinations of all that data. No one has affected oversight. And that means it's extremely difficult to spot trends and as patterns that really may give rise to patient safety concerns. Now, I've got no doubt that this is partly why women's concerns about the safety of mesh implants were unheeded for so long. Women were trying to report their complications. Some were listened to, but actually many were not. And no one joined the dots. No one spotted the trend. It was left to the patients, the patients themselves, to form support groups and to lobby MPs, go to the media, and that brought about our review. But I just want to say a word about politicians, because I get a very bad press. But I have to say, it was the politicians, it was Theresa May, the Prime Minister, who commissioned the review, because she recognised all that was coming into her inbox, and that it needed attention, it needed a review. The second fundamental issue is whether the right data is being collected. And we're not good at collecting data from the most important source, the patients themselves. Patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures are vital and they're not actually routinely captured. If we don't know how the patient feels, how do we know whether we've treated them successfully? Now, by collecting PROMs and PREMs routinely, we could identify problems at an early stage and cross-reference with data on devices, medications, and procedures. And this data needs to be collected over the long term. The neurodevelopment damage to children caused when their mother takes Valparate takes years to become apparent. Some of the complications women experience after mesh surgery also takes years to manifest itself. And complications change over time. So it's no good collecting data just a few months post-treatment. So we said in our um, review, the basic information about implanted devices like mesh is so important that its collect, uh, collection should be mandated. The name of the patient, the unique device identifier, the surgeon, the hospital, and all that should be in the central patient identifi identifiable database. At least then, if a concern about the device is sub subsequently raised, it will be possible to trace those who are affected. And the Secretary of State, it was Matt Hancock at that time, agreed with us and he issued the mandate in November 2019. But of course we need more than just the basic information. In our report, we recommended that the central database should be linked to newly created registries, and that would re uh, research and audit the outcomes, both in terms of the safety of the device and, crucially, PROMs and PREMs. Without them, we cannot measure the real success of a treatment. A doctor may say a woman's incontinence has been cured and mark that down as a successful treatment. But 
If she is suffering constant, excruciating pain, has lost her job, her partner, her mobility, her freedom, even if she is no longer incontinent, can we really call that a success? I think not. And yet that is what has happened. We said that the approach of having a database with specialised registries should apply not only to MeSH, but in time to all implantable devices and to medicines using, used in pregnancy. So while the core information on the national database is mandated, because it is just so important to collect, we said that the information collected by the registries should be subject to patient consent. That's because it is of a different order, a different level of information, including very personal information. And people should have the right to decide what they share and who they share it with. We published our report, First Do No Harm, in July 2020. And the recommendation about the database and registries was one of our nine major recommendations. So what has happened since? Last year, in the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, now an act, the government introduced what is known as the Medical Device Information System, or MDIS, to be led by NHS Digital. The concept is different from what we recommended, but the intention is the same. Instead of a core database and separate registries, all the information will be collected and analysed through one portal, the MDIS. Now, I am concerned about how consent sits in that arrangement and perhaps predictably, progress in creating the system has been slow, but it is encouraging that the government has accepted the need for changes and improvements in data collection and outcome measures. But bearing in mind the shortfalls I have just talked about, you may be forgiven for thinking they could hardly do otherwise. Technology and data themselves are not the barrier here. They are the enablers. The challenges are around reducing silos, joining up people, organisations and systems, putting the patient truly at the heart of their care and listening to them. Those are organisational changes but I have to say they are also cultural. The NHS and the wider healthcare system does do wonderful things. It saves lives. It improves lives. And it's there for us. But overwhelmingly, the people are dedicated, passionate and brilliant. But the system is not perfect. My review was an eye-opener for me and my team. <clears throat> and we heard and we learned from the thousands of people who came and spoke to us. And they had tragic, disturbing, and moving stories. All the more so because they could and should have been avoided. These people should not be suffering as they are now. When during our review, we travelled across the UK to meet in person those who were well enough to meet us. And there were some very common messages that we heard, whether, wherever we went and whoever we spoke to. One of those stood out in its selflessness. It was, please make sure that doesn't happen to anyone else. So... What has galvanised me is, after our review was finished and our report published, 
together with Jeremy Hunt, we said we've got to do something. We've got to do more to implement the recommendations. So we set up an all-party parliamentary group on First Do No Harm. And I want to pay a tribute to Philip Hunt, who's one of our officers. And Philip Hunt has been simply marvellous. I cannot tell you what support he's given to those of us who carried out this review. It has been awesome, as my, uh, my grandchild would say. And um, I have to say that um, this group is really to make sure we learn the lessons. We help those who need and deserve help. And we do what they asked us to do. Make sure this never happens to anyone else. So I'm no expert in data and tech, I'm, I'm far from it. But that experience in listening to people who have lost so much through no fault of their own is the context and the reason why I've been interested in data. So that is why I'm determined to ensure we use data, that we harness technology, and we improve systems to create safer, better, more informed, and more caring healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm Philip Hunt, and it's my great pleasure to chair this morning's session. Thank you, Julia, for your kind remarks. Uh, I don't think we could have had a better exposition of the link between digital transformation, GS1 standards, and patient safety, and I think this is really the theme for our conference over the next two days. The challenge is embedding that within the many and varied structures of the, a national health service, which actually is um, an organisation which has many players nationally and locally. Uh, and I think as we, Julia's going to come back on the stage um, after the next speaker, uh, and we're going to have a big discussion uh, about this. So um, I should say, Julia was on her feet in the House of Lords late last night, um, um, encouraging ministers to think some more about patient safety. So she's been a real champion and a real champion for our standards as well. So um, may I now very warmly introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kelsey Flott. Kelsey. <laughs> 